I think it would be a very good practice for us on the Lord's Day to take home our bulletins and refer to the corporate confession of sin uh, that we read in our worship service to refer to it during the week. All of them are very good, but this corporate confession of sin tonight is especially good. I did not choose it in, in any way. Uh, Ann is the one who chooses these uh, confessions. I had no idea the similarities that would be found here in this corporate confession and the message that I have tonight from Matthew 26, but you're going to see many of them as we go through the scripture here in a few moments. So turn, if you would, to Matthew 26, and we will read in a few moments verses 36 through 46. Matthew 26, verses 36 through 46. Let's ask God to uh, open our minds and, and open our hearts, unstop our ears that we might hear his word. Let us pray. Lord, we do thank you once again for this uh, beautiful evening that we have to, to be in, in this sanctuary and to, uh, to gather in this place and to be found studying your word and reflecting upon the, the agony and, and the passion of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to say in a few moments in this sermon, uh, in this passage of Scripture, we are standing on holy ground. Lord, do we know that that is true each and every time that we open the Bible and we seek to understand its contents and we seek to understand its truth. Uh, but there are some sections of Scripture that uh, literally push us to the, to the edge of, of seeing into heaven and seeing the relationship uh, that exists between God the Father and God the Son. And we thank you for this uh, portrayal and this um, record from, from actual history where the very Son of God struggled with the will of the Father for him, uh, even prayed for the cup to be removed. But how we thank you for that wonderful determination on his part when he said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. So, Father, help us now and help our minds as we come to your word. I know for some of us today, it's been a very busy day in all likelihood with our jobs and with our responsibilities. And so we ask that you would quicken our minds and, and quicken our hearts to understand the wonderful truths uh, that are found in this section of the word of God. And we pray in our Savior's name. Amen. Matthew 26, beginning to read at verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. This is the word of the Lord. I want us to begin our time together this evening by thinking back in time. Let us think back to our first exposure to Christianity. Maybe you were a child and you were raised in a Christian church and your conversion was not a dramatic conversion. You look back at your life and you cannot notice any real uh, dramatic uh, transformation. You have always believed the gospel. You've always seen your sinfulness and your need for the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and you are a believer today, you are, are walking in assurance of your faith in Christ. Maybe you were a child raised in the church, but you went astray, and your return to the church and the Christian faith was dramatic. Or maybe you were raised with no church involvement at all, and usually when that is the case, our uh, turn to Christianity is a very dramatic occasion. In my case, it was the second scenario. Uh, I was raised in the church. I went astray in my teens and early 20s, and then I experienced a dramatic conversion in May of 1979, almost 40 years ago. That is really, really hard to, uh, to believe. I was eating with someone this week, and they said, how old are you? <laughs> and I said, in a month, I'll turn 60. But anyway, uh, 40 years ago, it just doesn't seem real. But no matter your story, what were those early days like? The risen, exalted Christ upbraids the Ephesian church in Revelation 2 with these words, you have abandoned the love that you had at first. For most of us, there is a love, there is a freshness, there is an excitement when we begin our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. When I came to faith, I was a young college student. As you know, I was, was pursuing a career in veterinary uh, medicine and to get experience in the world of animal husbandry, I worked on a number of dairy farms. Now dairy cattle eat, and they eat a lot. And so when you're a dairy farmer, you spend a lot of your time plowing ground, planting corn, planting alfalfa, fertilizing the ground, taking care of that food, harvesting it, putting it into silos. Uh, you spend a lot of your time on a tractor, and the tractor that I spent a lot of time on was a John Deere. You've heard of John Deere tractors uh, before. Now... I wanted to do spiritual things on the John Deere. It was hard to read my Bible. In fact, it would have been very dangerous to read my Bible on the John Deere tractor. It was somewhat difficult to pray with the noise of the tractor uh, in my ears, uh, but it was liberating to sing. And I remember riding that John Deere tractor in the hills and hollers of western, uh, southwestern Kentucky and singing. At the top of my lungs, uh, the hymns that I was learning in that Baptist church on Sunday. And one of those hymns went like this. King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow. Lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Does the line not haunt you as it haunts me, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony? Lest I forget thine love for me, lead me to Calvary. Do not the New Testament writers go to great pains to teach us that Christ suffered for us? How could we ever forget this? How could our hearts ever go after anything else in life? Then the relationship we should have with the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.14, for the love of Christ, Paul says, it controls, it controls us. Some of the translations say it constrains us, it hems us in. Once we see it, it is what our life is all about because we have concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. This was stated by a witness of what happened. And again, 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. Christ's death was substitutionary. He died in the place of His people. He suffered God's wrath so that we might never suffer and face 
the judgment of God. Yes, that line should haunt us. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget his agony for me, lest I look upon the cross and just treat it in a very casual, in a very flippant way. See, Gethsemane marks the final stages of Christ's life on this earth. His arrest, trial, and crucifixion and death for us are only hours away. What stands out in the passage that is before us this evening? Well, first of all, quite simply, we see sleepy disciples. See, there is this staggering contrast in the passage between Christ's passion in pursuit of the will of God and the spiritual apathy and the drowsiness of these apostles. In Luke's gospel, we are told that the agony is so severe that Christ's sweat is like great drops of blood falling to the ground. He is facing the agony. He is contemplating God's will for him. He is praying like he's never prayed before. He is falling to the ground, as you see. And the dream team is asleep. Verse 40, he came to his disciples and found them sleeping. Verse 43, again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. Verse 45, and he came to his disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. Now doesn't this passage require of us some gut level honesty? Do we not see ourselves in them? Isn't our passion for the will of God sickening at times compared to Christ's? But see, folks, this is the whole point of the gospel. I don't mention that to you tonight to necessarily make you feel bad and guilty. I mention that to you tonight to go once again to the cross of Christ because He is the one who has accomplished our salvation. His passion for us is the issue, not our passion for Him. And that's part of our minds being wrapped up in the story of the cross and seeing it in a new way, seeing it in a fresh way, seeing ourselves in the disciples and realize that we have transgressed the law of God. We have done it today. And we need the passion of the Lord Jesus Christ, His suffering in our place, if we would ever find a right standing with our God. You know, in the early days of my walk with Christ in that Baptist church in Martin, Tennessee, I was taught the value of a daily quiet time, a daily time of Bible reading and prayer. Now, there is great value in this, and if you practice it, uh, don't abandon it. If you don't practice, why don't you just go ahead and start in the morning? Start tonight. It's a good practice. Um, go to bed, out, uh, to bed an hour earlier so you can get up in the morning and meet with your God in His Word and, and through prayer. I find those times in my life often very, very rewarding. But on too many occasions... Too many I care to mention I nod off. Even after a good night's sleep, even with the coffee sitting there on the table, I nod off. And every single time that happens, I don't know what you think about, but every single time that happens to me, I think about this right here. I am just a sleepy, worthless, struggling disciple that needs the Lord Jesus Christ and needs Him desperately. And how thankful I am that my salvation is not dependent upon my passion for Christ, but His passion for me. And the thing about the passage that stands out is not only this Godward focus on the part of the Lord Jesus Christ, He hasn't given up on His disciples. He turns to them in their lack of passion. He turns to them in their sin, and He's still willing to instruct them. He's instructing them all the way up to His cross.
And notice what he says, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Christ is saying you are born again. You have a willing spirit. You have a heart and a desire to obey and to do the right thing. But you are still a human being. You still inhabit a sinful body. And the cure is twofold. Watch, pray. Now this is not primarily a message tonight on the doctrine of sanctification, but if you want two words that are very crucial in your Christian walk, it's these two right here. You need to be watchful. You need to look out for sin in your heart. You need to be on your guard from the devil. You need to put on the full armor of God. You need to realize that you wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. There is this watchfulness, there is this care There is this awareness that we live in a dark and a sinful world. And we are to be a a watchful people, a a people that are on our guard. But we're also to be a prayerful people. Christ is just living out before these disciples the lesson of what it takes to be a spiritual man and a spiritual woman. Not walking around in pride and self-sufficiency, but falling on our face before our God in our weakness and crying out to Him in prayer. If the Lord Jesus Christ needed it, you can bet your bottom dollar we need it too. So the sleepy servants or the drowsy disciples. Notice secondly, the suffering Savior. I've already mentioned it in my prayer this evening, that in this passage we are standing on on holy ground. There are numerous places in the gospel that we stand on holy ground. Uh, Christ's baptism comes to mind. His temptation comes to mind. The transfiguration and maybe the holiest of the holy ground sections in the life of Christ is His crucifixion when He is crying out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? or that exclamation as he died, into your hands I commit my spirit, it is finished. But Gethsemane is surely at the top of the list as well of the holy ground places in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we should approach these verses with deepest reverence and deepest care. Some of the deepest insight into Christ's relationship with His heavenly Father and the nature of His saving work are found in these verses. And we should come to this passage and pray for insight and pray for understanding as we approach these verses. What are some of the things that stand out in this passage about Christ? Well, first of all, you see His sorrow. You see his mental anguish, verse 38. My soul is not just sorrowful, it is very sorrowful, even to the point of death. Now the word here in the Greek is very graphic. It is the word for sorrow, but it is preceded by a preposition that means to be surrounded by sorrow. In other words, my soul is literally engulfed, Christ is saying with sorrow and grief over what I am facing. I am overwhelmed in my distress. Paul, I believe, speaks of a similar experience in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 when it says, For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. And the... um, short-sighted thing to do in this passage is to look at it just simply in terms of physical death and think that this is primarily what Christ is talking about when he's talking about his sorrow. I'm sure some of us have experienced that sometimes when we think about the thought of our own death and the loss that will be there and the grief of losing and departing from loved ones and just what the whole experience of death might be. And we may think, well, Christ was going through similar things just over his physical death at this point. But in this passage, we must think theologically. See, his physical death is not the primary source of his sorrow. He is about to drink the cup 
that he speaks of in verses 39 and 42. As our creed says, he is beginning his descent into hell. He is about to bear the eternal wrath of God for us in our place. And it is these ideas and these concepts that are causing the sorrow that he mentions in verse 38. So we see his sorrow. Secondly, we see his sonship. We see the deep relationship he had and still has with God the Father, the first person of the Trinity. Notice verse 39. My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Notice verse 42. My Father, if this cannot pass until I drink it, your will be done. And in verse 44 we read, He prayed for the third time, saying the same word again. Now human reason fails us at this point. Every relationship we experience in life has a beginning and an ending. But Christ experienced an eternal father-son relationship with God the Father. And at this point, that relationship, it seems strained. There seems to be a tension that is here, an interruption that is about to occur. God's will for the Son seems so dark. He is envisioning a separation from this eternal source of joy and sustenance. For some of us, the most traumatic thought that ever passes through our minds is the loss of our spouse and what we would do if that were to occur. We'll multiply that thought by infinity and an eternal relationship with someone and you begin to get the idea of what is transpiring in this passage. Charles Wesley penned those unforgettable lines. Tis mystery all the immortal dies. Who can explore this strange design? The Spirit of God is cracking open the door for us to a certain degree here. He is allowing us to fathom God's strange design in the death and in the suffering of His Son. But notice thirdly, Christ's supplication. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Now Christ here is picking up on rich Old Testament imagery. Let's look at a few of the passages that we find in the Old Testament that give us an understanding of what he means when he mentions the cup. Look at Psalm 75 and verse 8. Psalm 75 and verse 8. <clears throat> For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. This image has to do with God's wrath towards the wicked and the final judgment that will occur when they are judged. Isaiah 51 speaks of this as well. Isaiah 51 and verse 17. Wake yourself. Wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of His wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl, the cup of staggering. And then in verse 22, thus says your Lord, the Lord your God, who pleads the cause of His people, behold, I have taken from your hand the cup of staggering, the bowl of my wrath, you shall drink no more. And then finally, we see this concept in Jeremiah's prophecy. Jeremiah 25, verses 15 through 18. Jeremiah 25, verses 15 through 18. 
Thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send uh, you drink it. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I am sending among them. So I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom the Lord sent me drink it. Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, its kings and officials, to make them a desolation and a waste, a hissing and a curse as at this day. So Christ is picking up on this Old Testament imagery when he speaks of this cup and prays that it might pass from him. See, the cup represents all the wrath that is due for all the sin committed by all the people of God since the Garden of Eden. All the wrath that is due for all of the sin committed by all the people of God since the Garden of Eden. You see why I say that we are standing on holy ground in this moment as we try to understand these things? The human mind has difficulty comprehend, comprehending this and comprehending the full implications of what is transpiring. How many of you have thought about hell this week? And if you have thought about hell this week, how long have you thought about it? Yeah, probably hadn't thought about it, and if you have thought about it, you don't think about it that long. Why do we not think about it that long? Because it is such a horrible, horrible concept. This is why many preachers never mention it from the pulpit. This is why some preachers, even some that I greatly admire in other areas of their writing and commentaries that they have written, have um, uh, subscribed to a view called annihilationism, that at the end of time... Uh, those that do not know Christ will just be annihilated. They will just be destroyed. They are seeking to lessen the horror of the teaching of the doctrine of eternal punishment. See, folks, this is what is going through Christ's mind. This is what he is dealing with. Drinking the cup. Drinking it down to its very dregs. Drinking every single bit of the wrath of God that is due unto lost sinners so that they might go free. See, in Gethsemane, Christ stared hell in the face. And He did it for you, and He did it for me. And in this supplication, we see His humanity. This passage is revealing incredible insight concerning the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, we see His humanity in this request for the cup to be removed from Him. He was a man. And He was struggling with these concepts just like we struggle with these concepts when we try to think of them. But in addition to that, He knew that He was getting ready to bear this, to carry this to His cross. A little wonder He cried out. The Spirit of God is pushing us to the limit here, we are permitted to gaze upon things that are unseen as we think about this concept of his supplication. But then finally, we see his submission. Verse 39. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Verse 42, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Do you realize that your eternal salvation hinges upon these words and hinges upon these concepts? Christ stared your judgment and my judgment in the face and said, nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. His passion for God's will and the rescue of God's people was so all-encompassing. His love for us so thorough and complete. Therefore we read, See, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. One of my favorite movies is a movie called 
Countdown to D-Day with Tom Selleck. I don't know if any of you have seen that movie before. Uh, it's not really a war movie in the sense of a lot of drama and a lot of, well, there's a lot of drama, but there's not a lot of war scenes and things of that nature. Uh, the movie is just dealing with the behind-the-scenes decisions that were going on leading up to D-Day and the many, many decisions that Ike Eisenhower had to make. He was one of the most amazing men in the 20th century, by the way. And we may not be here in freedom if it weren't for him. But there is a point in that movie when the decision had to be made for D-Day. And if you remember anything about that, there were weather concerns, there were timing concerns. If they didn't choose this particular day, it would be another month, and they were concerned that Hitler would find out about and be waiting for them with greater strength. In other words, he was in the crucible of decision. And you remember what he said, two words to his generals. Let's go. Let's do it. And Christ is looking judgment in the face. He's looking at the will of God that is set before him in the cross. And he said, let's do it. Let's go so that the people of God might be rescued. I'll drink the cup. I'll drink it fully and completely so that the people of God might know deliverance. So the sleepy servants, the suffering Savior, and finally, and this will come as a surprise, the silent God. God didn't answer his prayer for deliverance. As it says in Romans 8, he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. The heavens, as we say, were brass. There was no answer from the Father. Now Luke's gospel says that angels attended him, but his Father did not deliver him from judgment. There is a wonderful lesson here that I picked up on. It's not the main point of the passage, but it is certainly something that is helpful for us and dealing with the whole issue of unanswered prayer in our lives, when God doesn't answer our prayers. Listen to what the commentator says. This account discloses, discloses to us something of the mystery of unanswered prayer. This prayer of Jesus himself, who enjoyed the most intimate relationship with the Father, was not answered. The Father, in His inscrutable wisdom, had to say no to the content of His Son's prayer. Otherwise, there would have been no salvation for anyone, and the kingdom would have shattered in pieces. Jesus had prayed, If it is not possible for this cup to be taken away, unless I drink, may your will be done. And the Father took Him at His word. The prayer of Jesus in Gethsemane, and here's the key sentence, shows us that we can be close to God, we can live a holy life, we can pray with faith, earnestness, and expectancy, and yet not get what we ask for. It is a profound mystery before which we must bow. When unanswered prayer comes along in your life, do you bow? Do you submit? Do you say to the Father, your will is best, and my will is to be set to the side? That's one of the reasons I said concerning our corporate confession of sin, go on with thy patient work. Answering no to my wrongful prayers and fitting me to accept it. So we learn a lesson concerning unanswered prayer, but we also learn something of the abandonment and the horror 
of what Christ went through so that we might be saved. I want to read just another uh, section from the writing of C.S. Lewis in his book on prayer called Letters to Malcolm, where he talks about an aspect of Gethsemane. And it goes like this. Does not every movement in the passion write large some common element in the sufferings of our race? First, the prayer of anguish, not granted. Then he turns to his friends, and they're asleep as ours or we are so often, or busy or away or preoccupied. Then he faces the church, the very church that he brought into existence, and it condemns him. This also is characteristic. In every church, in every institution, there is something which sooner or later works against the very purpose for which it came into existence. But there seems to be another chance. There is the state, in this case the Roman state. Its pretensions are far lower than those of the Jewish church, but for that very reason it may be free from local fanaticisms. It claims to be just on a rough worldly level, yes, but only so far as is consistent with political expediency. One becomes a counter in a complicated game, but even now all is not lost. There is still an appeal to the people, the poor and simple whom he had blessed, whom he had healed and fed and taught to whom he himself belongs. But they have become overnight. And it is nothing unusual, a murderous rabble shouting for his blood. There is then nothing left but God. And to God, God's last words, why have you forsaken me? You see how characteristic, how representative it all is, the human situation writ large these are among the things it means to be a man. Every rope breaks when you seize it. Every door is slammed shut as you reach it. C.S. Lewis, I believe, had reflected upon Gethsemane. He had reflected upon what our Lord went through for us so that we might be forgiven and that we might be a free people passage of scripture that I refer to over and over again, and by the way, I'm praying about preaching through Romans beginning in 2019. I've taught through Romans on Wednesday nights in the early days of my ministry here, but I'm thinking about uh, doing it on our Sunday morning worship services. If you'll remember that the title of my studies from verse 28 through the end of the chapter was the, the greatest verses of the greatest chapter in all of the Bible. And some of the greatest verses within those verses are verses 31 and 32. I come back to these verses all the time, and I'm sure you do too, where Paul says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, if He's on our team, if He is on our side, then then who can be against us? And here's Gethsemane, and here's the cross. He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? Paul is saying, contemplate the cross. Go to Gethsemane. Ponder what your Lord went through for you. And if God would do the ultimate, if Christ Himself would say, nevertheless, my, uh, nevertheless uh, your will be done, then it just makes sense that all the little things that we fret about and that we complain about and we moan about before God, God's going to take care of. Because Christ has gone to the cross. Christ has done the ultimate for us. God did not spare His own Son. He sent the jewel of heaven to Calvary's cross so that we might be forgiven and so that we might rise up in victory and say, what shall we say to these things? If this God is for us, who can be against us? 
Let us pray.